Let's start from the beginning. Nobody told me to win Wimbledon 17. I just did it. Wimbledon champion Boris Becker. My game was power. Mental strength. That's how I would describe Boris. He was like Michael Jordan in Germany. Expectations in tennis for it. Becoming a superstar in sports. You're now a wanted man. To pick a black woman as his wife was a big deal. In the German press, it was a black and white thing. When you step away from the game, you come into a completely different life. It's sort of walking into a dark room. She came in, she had a big coat on, and she took the coat off. She was heavily pregnant, which you can't believe it. The wake-up call came very late. Boris Becker is facing two and a half years in jail for hiding assets during bankruptcy. I've hit my, my bottom. That's not the end yet. There's going to be another chapter. Ready? Play. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time it is in the world, wherever you are tuning in from. I'm joined by John Batsek. The first thing I have to check with him, like I do with all my guests, is am I saying your name right? You are you are absolutely saying it yeah, right. Yes, well done. There were much trickier ones on the tennis mm -hmm. tour in particular. Uh, you and I are both football fans, and I think because in football we hear, you know, Lionel Messi a million times before we even start using it ourselves. We're so familiar that it's Lionel and not Lionel that it's quite normal. In tennis, the names are just sort of thrust upon you. One of the other easier ones, though, in the sporting world, at least, is the name of Boris Becker. I guess you didn't have to ask him how his name was pronounced. Um, John, before we get into Becker and, and obviously the documentary, I want to ask you about you. What's your, mm. your background and who are you? Um, my background? Well, I am I was born in Hampshire Garden, suburb in London. My parents were both massive movie fans and sports fans. My brother and sister the same family of mad Chelsea fans and we played we played all sports and we watched all sports and uh you know my my I guess my brother and I both sort of stumbled into the movie business it wasn't certainly wasn't my intention I think we both wanted to be sportsmen but we weren't quite good enough at anything um and um my brother moved to Australia in fact and and um started working for Hoyts a long, 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 long time ago. And that's how he got into the movie business. And he came over to England, came back to England and started working for Palace Pictures. And he's six years older than me <clears throat> or five years older than me. And uh, at the point at which I dropped out of college and didn't have a clue what I was going to do, he helped me get a job in a film publicity company. And that's how I, that was the start of my journey in the movie business. And my brother has gone on to, be one of the greatest distributors of films, you know, there's been, and he, he took over, he, he ran Disney in the UK. He took over from the Weinsteins at Miramax when they left. He ran National Geographic and he's now head of film four and has been for a few years. So he's, he's very much in the scripted world predominantly. Um, and I, I was a publicist for 10 years, then produced a scripted movie, which took four and a half years and was the most miserable experience of my life. And that, but 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 I owe, I owed a great debt of gratitude because that's what nudged me in the direction of documentaries, and that's all I've ever done since then is make documentaries. Obviously, we're here to talk about um, a fairly recent one of yours. Um, what did you know about Boris Becker before embarking on this journey with him, if you like? Well, because I'm a sports anorak, I knew a tremendous amount. I mean, I remember watching him obviously because I grew up. I was of an age where. I watched his career. I saw the whole thing. Um, so I knew everything about him. I knew about him as a coach and I knew, you know, I knew, yeah, I knew all about his career and, and, and obviously was, you know, when he was, when he was, when he was winning Wimbledon to start with, you know, I, I was not a fan because of course I was a Johnny Mac fan and, you know, wow. and he was this brash young German who just was bloody winning Wimbledon age 17. It was infuriating. Um, <laughs> But as I got older, I grew to appreciate. I grew to appreciate his incredible career, and as I got a lot older, I really and I got into the sort of psychology of sport and some of the other films I made. I was totally knocked out by his career, and and also by all professional tennis players, particularly because it strikes me it's one of those sports where, and I think and I think people don't really understand this, or they take it for granted. And I hoped our film could do something about this, but 
because I played tennis, obviously nowhere near that level, what it takes to hit the ball, the way they hit the ball, every time they hit the ball is a mental strength that people can't even begin to understand. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if Boris could talk us through what that is, where it comes from, and how he was able to have it at age 17, apart from anything else. And then I, so I knew all about his career. Then I went and saw a movie. I was at the Toronto Film Festival. I can't remember when. I guess it must be six or seven years ago. And I saw a movie called Love Means Zero, which was about Nick Bollicieri. And Boris mm -hmm. appears in it briefly for like five minutes, completely stole the show. He tells that great story of playing Agassi and losing to Agassi and flirting with Brooke Shields and completely unsettling Andre and winning the game mm -hmm. as a result. And just the way he told it and the twinkle in his eye and the sort of lack of filter and the way he told it, I remember thinking, wow, he'd be a great subject for a film. And and that's so that's how I started on the journey. But But I definitely knew as much as anyone who isn't a sports journalist might have known about Boris. There were a couple of, no, more than a couple, a few snippets in the film that from Boris himself that made me chuckle. Uh, you touching on the fact that he was a German, obviously doing pretty well in London in the mid 80s with certain other memories still a little fresh, let's say. And yet he said, you know, I'm one of the most popular guys in, in England, but it is or popular German guys, but it's a pretty short list, you know, he he highlights. And there's also, I think, a couple of speeches he gives that that made me chuckle. Um, what did you make of Boris? And did your opinion of him change before and after making this documentary? Um, <clears throat> you know, in a way, in a way, well, he, he's he's he was and still is really personable, very charming, really intelligent, really engaged, very into documentaries and and very knowledgeable, very, very knowledgeable. And um, and so, you know, he's a I think he's I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't have a lot of experience of meeting these sort of people, but he's a, one of the good guys. You know, he's he's you can tell immediately his heart is in the right place. The thing one of the some of the things that surprised me were that you know, I discovered very quickly that Boris, part of the reason Boris wanted to make this film was that he was deeply frustrated with how he'd been represented throughout his life and throughout his career, how, you know, how people had distorted the facts and the truth about him. And he found it incredibly frustrating. I think possibly most of all in Germany, where they'd been incredibly tough on him. And and I very quickly got the sense of this man who'd lived this extraordinary life, had achieved unbelievable things, both on the sporting field and off it, because he, he had an incredible career as a player. He had a fantastic career as a coach, and he's got a wonderful career as a commentator as well. He's superb at that. And actually, if you wandered down the street and asked 100 people if you said Boris Becker to them, they would probably say no boo is the first thing they would say, and bankrupt is the second thing they would say. And if you consider this as a man who won six majors, Olympic gold, coached Novak, and kind of was definitely at the pivot moment for Novak where he became a Grand Slam winner in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. um, and then has become this beloved commentator on the BBC and all sorts of other, you know, it seemed pretty, I could imagine being super frustrated that the two things that stand out were the things I just mentioned. And also, you know, there was this incredible part of Boris's story, which was falling in love with Barbara and getting into that relationship and marrying Barbara and how that went down in Germany and how ultimately mm -hmm. he was sort of driven out of Germany in some respects for having married um, a, 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 a mixed race woman. And mm -hmm. and then finally, it went all the way back to when he won Wimbledon age 17 and his father had said, I want you to come back to Lyman and we're going to have a parade and this and that and this and that. And Boris was like, no, even at 17, he was like, I don't want to do that. That isn't who I am. I don't want to do it. And I won't do it. And then he eventually did do it. But he said to his dad, I'm going to do this for you because you're my father and I love you. But but and that sort of all plays into this sort of mess representation. Boris paraded in Lyman as the mm. post child of post-war Germany. And, and he's like, that's not me. And I don't want to be that. So I really felt this sense of a amazing life lived and not acknowledged for so many of those things must be a great frustration. So that that was kind of a powerful and surprising factor. And now, sort of, you know, the, the dust has settled on the documentary. Do you still feel all of those things? Are they accentuated? Is that what you've learned through it? Or or have you also got some other perspectives uh, on him? I mean, you know, <clears throat> I suppose, you know, that I suppose the other some of the other perspectives are, you know, Boris 
like many famous people, like many famous sportsmen, has lived this life where where very quickly your responsibilities are not taken away from you, but you're able to just let them fall aside because there's always someone to pick them up. So, so he, you know, as he would say, you know, he went, never went to a cash point in his life. He never checked a bank account in his life because he didn't need to because he knew there was a ton of money in there and someone was managing it for him. And when yeah. he needed it, it was in his hand. And um, I think the sort of the disempowerment of that, the, 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 the letting go of your own responsibility of that is something that I, I see now looking at Boris's experience of how that let him down and led him astray and how he let that happen. And he says himself in the film, you know, his son says, I forget what his son says, you know, dad, what are the lessons of your story? And he says, am I allowed to swear or not on this? Ah, uh, you can. I might bleep it out afterwards, but yeah, go on. Well, he's, you know, he said he said to his son, "Take care of your own shit," because oh, okay, that's, that's, what, that's what he didn't do. Um, and I think he's, you know, and he's he's wounded by that. And of course, you know, I we we interviewed him three days before he was sentenced to just jail sentence. I was in New York. We did it remotely. I flew home so I could be in court to sort of be some support for Boris. And I got, and I was there the day he was sentenced. And, you know, it was devastating. The The interview itself was devastating. He was absolutely broken, which was shocking for all of us, including Lily and his partner who was there as well. It was a really shocking moment because Boris has never broken down. I don't think he's ever broken down at any point in his life, no, not on the court or off the court. And that's mm. what happened there. And it was upsetting. And I think, Obviously, you know, the, that experience and the experience of prison has humbled him to a certain extent. But he's still Boris Becker, you know, he's still got the swagger and he's still he's still got the charisma. And yeah, yeah you know, he carries on. What I uh, I started to do towards the end of the uh, the, the two part documentary is actually I started to write down a list of, of some of the influences, if you like, and I put them into two categories just because that's what I was feeling as I was watching it. And. What I found was that pretty much the external characters in in his career and in his life, for example, the opponents, uh, the people that didn't coach him, and anyone else that was around him. But but I mean, even even you know, fans or or, or people working in the media, for example, uh, you know, they they you know, Andre Agassi. There's a great anecdote that he gives. I want to come to it in a second at, at the Berlin. Uh, sorry, the Munich Beer Festival uh, and various others, you know, Brad Gilbert, I know he didn't coach him, but these are all external people and Nick Bolateri, who you touched on earlier. And they all fall into a pretty good ca category of one sort, John McEnroe too, you know. They all fall into a, they've got, uh, despite wanting to beat him on the tennis court, generally they've got Boris' best interests at heart, which is the opposite to most of the people that he comes across that he internalizes, if that makes sense, into his world. With the exception of one or two women, I think Barbara comes across really well. Obviously, she's somebody that that became internalized into onto Planet Boris, if you like. But a lot of these outside figures that then became internalized, you know, the the business guy in Switzerland, um, even to some extent, maybe Ian Tyriak. There's there's moments when there's this. What, what give, tell us about Ian Tyriak actually, and tell us about what what you made of him. And tell us who he was as well, in a way. I mean, Boris is basically main coach for the early part of his career, right? Yeah, it's Jan Tyriak. Jan Tyriak, sorry, I've written him. Romanian, was a pro himself, a decent pro himself. Then he became a coach and he coached Guillermo Vilas, who I think at the time that he coached him, I think maybe number one in the world. Um, and then he became Boris's coach at a very young age. I have to say, I think... I do think he always had Boris's best interests at heart, actually. I think the thing about Jan is that he was tough as hell. He didn't take any BS from anyone, Boris included. And 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 he guided Boris and he was but he was harsh with him and he was hard with him. And you know, and he 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 was he's a very he was a very straight talker and he laid he laid Boris's future out for him and he and he was absolutely right in terms of the perils, the risks and the you know, the advantages and the opportunities. And I think he he did a very, very good job of monetizing Boris both on the courts and off the courts. Um, but he's remained a, a lifelong and important friend to Boris. And I know that was incredibly supportive to Boris through his legal struggles and then while he was in prison. But what he did do, you know, was when Boris said, 
you know, I'm going to now start playing with my own money, investing my own money. It's in the film. He says, you know, well, this is what you should do. Take 2% of it. And once you've lost it, don't take any more. Mm -hmm. And I think Boris got to a point in his life when he didn't like having people who, I guess, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know that I'm 100% sure, but I think what Boris grew to not like was having someone who didn't toe the line. And Jan wasn't going to toe the line. He was... He was always going to be very straight with Boris about what he thought was right and what was wrong. And if Boris chose not to like his advice, then he could walk away. But he wasn't going to change his advice just to secure his job. Um, and that's what happened. And, and, and I think Boris would be the first to admit that things went astray significantly once he did separate from him. There were a couple of moments in the, uh, in the documentary um, where Alex, Alex Gibney, uh, who wrote and directed this as well, um, where he sort of you know kind of goes off script if you like as in like Boris has said something and then there's like a a moment where where Alex will say something like you know this is odd because mm. two minutes ago he said this or mm. in other statements he said this so he kind of highlights one or two contradictions and I think Boris's life uh is occasionally contradictory let's say sure. um was that was that in the plan or was that just like oh hang on a second maybe we should tell the audience this I mean, have you seen any other of Alex's films? He does it in all his movies. That is definitely oh, okay. his signature. That is his signature. And we talked about it at the beginning, you know, because I, I, I sort of, I suppose my ambitions were that we wouldn't need to do that, but it is exactly how Alex makes his films. And, and, it, and, it, and, and as it turned out, I think he felt, and I think he was right, it was important to present the audience, to, to let the audience know that the director was aware of the contradictions and wanting to make sure the audience was gathering was picking up on them as well so i mean they're not too many of those moments but yes it's definitely the way that he makes his films i mean they are you're right it's occasional but it's just it's it's pertinent and, and i think it was interesting um the gunslinger kind of wild west idea that we see a bit more in the first part i think than the second part where did that come from what was the thinking behind that i mean was it because it's tennis and a whacking the ball as hard as you can at times etc yeah i think it was alex's idea and i think it was sort of you know, he's sort of suggesting that in those days, it was a sort of turning point in tennis, wasn't it? It was a bit, well, it was a bit like the Wild West. And you had these these sort of, these characters who were just extraordinary players in their own different ways. Johnny Mack, Ivan Lendl, Boris himself, um, Stefan Edberg, Bjorn Borg. And also the way they went about playing each other, not least John McEnroe, as you'll know from the film, which was very confrontational. You know, and Lendl as well. You know, they did not get on. At, no one got on with Ivan Lendl on court. And I think that and the fact that, that Alex was very keen to have some Sergio, some, yeah, Sergio Leone, Ennio Morricone score in the film, all, all pointed in the direction of the whole sort of gunslinger motif that he uses in the film. Tell us about Barbara Becker. Uh, she, uh, it feels like she probably gets probably second only to Boris in terms of, of airtime. Tell us about what you think about the influence that she had and, and, and how she came across. Boris connected us to her. Barbara, you know, all my dealings with Barbara, I mean, she was just utterly charming and 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 incredibly classy and extremely bright and 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 very open and sensitive and honest, you know, and I I I, I was mightily impressed with her. Um you know she loves Boris deeply. They have a they have a, obviously a, a long history together. They have several children together. Mm -hmm. They remain in touch, and I think good friends. Um, and you know she 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 was there through the heyday of it all, um, and and actually was incredibly dignified in the way that she handled the split and the way she talks about it and the way she reflects back on it and does so in such a way, as I said, where she it doesn't diminish the love she feels for him. Um, you know, and she's, she's, a, she's a very impressive lady. Um, the, well, let's get to, to one or two of the tennis moments. Cause most of my audience are probably into tennis and I think, come on, let's get to some of those moments. Well, um, first of all, of course, Becca's career in, in, in Wimbledon, funny enough, what, what, I knew this, but I, I, I'd kind of forgotten somehow. All his actual crazy success happened in the, the, well, in terms of winning the tournament, happened in three of the first four times or five times he, he, he appeared there. He was, certainly had a run of finals. I think it was six out of seven between 85 and 91. 
Um, but a couple of things on the tennis side that I want to highlight is, uh, first of all, it's the Agassi story I touched on a minute ago when Agassi and, and him, who've not maybe always seen eye to eye on the court, but that's kind of normal. You're trying to beat each other and it, it can be tricky, especially when you win or lose, especially there's a great match that you highlight where where Becker's kind of down a set and, and 4-1, I think, and manages to come back. And then, of course, you've got the drama that you mentioned with, with Nick Boloteri previously being in Agassi's corner and now in Becker's. And then there's the book shield thing as well. But what I liked is that kind of when the dust had more or less settled or coming towards the end of their careers, they met up for beers with um, Brad Gilbert, Agassi's coach following Boloteri, uh, and they met up for beers in Munich. And Boris wants to know, how did you have such a good handle on my serve? Um, Agassi was famous for being a, a, a great returner anyway, but, but Boris is another level, if you like, when it comes to serving, both in terms of speed and spotting. And then tell us what, 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 what we know now, what, what Agassi said in response. I mean, first of all, if you remember slightly earlier, McEnroe said when Boris first came along, it was the biggest serve he'd ever faced in his life. And he thought, we're all done. This is it's over. Mm -hmm. This this boy is going to rule forever because they'd never seen a serve like that. You're right. Agassi was a... Andre's another player I would have loved to have made a film about and was a huge hero for me and an incredible player. Mm -hmm. um, and one of only four players to win each Grand Slam on a different surface. Yeah. Um, he... So Andre figured out that Boris had a tell, which was before he served, Boris would put his tongue in a certain place outside his mouth, either the left corner or the right corner, or I guess up the middle. Yeah, yeah. And each time that signified the side of the box that Boris was going to serve to. And that, as simple as that, is how Andre was able to, because after the he lost to him in that Wimbledon, I think it was a quarter final. Yeah. Andre thrashed him at the US Open, and that was how he did it. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's another tennis element as well, but I also think it is indicative of Boris's character, which is the the retirement topic, which comes and goes from as early as 91 to when it eventually happened, I think, in 99 or, or 2000. I think his last match was against Pat Rafter at Wimbledon. But actually, it's a, it's a almost recurring theme at least three times. And uh, what I found interesting was the was the Boris element of it. Uh, uh, you know, I love Boris and I think he comes across pretty well at times. And as you say, his heart in the right place shines through throughout this film, even if there are one or two contradictions. However, this retirement thing, I always got the impression that that it must be, you know, it's really difficult. You want to retire at the top. But I almost think that he, being a top, top sports person and someone with so much success, wants it to be almost a, a, he wants that to be a, a, as big a story as him winning Wimbledon at 17 in a way. And I, 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 for example, Michael Stick, 91, that final, he wants to win that final and retire and have that unbelievable arc of a story. 97, I think he plays Pete Sampras, uh, fourth round quarterfinals, Wimbledon, something like that. Pete outclasses him, but he tells Pete at the net, like it's almost like he's, he's pleased to tell Pete, by the way, you were my last match at Wimbledon. As it turns out, the mic caught it as well, and it ends up not being his last match. I think there was probably some emotional side of Boris. I don't think it was disingenuous. I think he genuinely felt that way. But then finally, the retirement does come uh, with that match against Pat Rafter. Hmm. Um, what did you think about the retirement element, some of the points I just mentioned, but also about how hard that may have hit him when it eventually did come? I, mean, I think you're right. I think, I think, I think, you know, I remember Boris getting to a point where he felt he was very vocal about the fact that he felt that Wimbledon was his home, that he kind of owned it and it owned him. And, and he had a sort of rightful place in the, in the, in the hierarchy of, of, of Wimbledon. Um, and so I imagine that he did like the idea of a sort of, of a fanfarish moment where he might, retire in glory or in defeat but in glorious defeat um and at the same time you know he's a young man and i'm sure as we know with lots of sportsmen and lots of sports it's a very very difficult moment because it's all they've known since they were tiny kids you know they've 24 7 that's all they've done and to to think about it not being the case anymore as we also know many sportsmen go very wildly off the rails very quickly once that's happened so i think I think ultimately Boris took it to the point where 
as you say, he was being outclassed by players and he's not a fool. And in that respect, you know, he would never have been someone who would just hang around for the sake of hanging around. Um, and also, I I feel like by that point, he'd already started to establish himself in the media. And so I think he knew he had a career to go on to. Um, but it's, as he, as you learn from the film, it it remains a very tough moment and and continuing to exist from that point on despite the fact that from the outside one would think what a great life he's been a fantastic pro now he's probably fairly handsomely rewarded as a pundit but it's not as simple as that and and there are all sorts of demons that come in and 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 boris definitely fell foul of of a lot of that stuff there's a, a poignancy as well in terms of london being his home uh you know i I mentioned how affectionately he talks about the UK. Uh, mm. I, I live in Germany. I'm quite familiar of the German sentiment towards him, which I still think runs through, you know, the the idea that he's just this, you know, he even gets criticized in Germany for his level of English. I'm like, he works on the BBC. You can't work in commentary with that. But the, the German level of English is obviously very high. I think there's the tabloid image that has been portrayed. And so certain things has, have come across in Germany. I think in London, he was, by the time he retired and by the time he was working, working on the BBC, he was largely very popular. Um, but uh, the poignancy I wanted to highlight, sorry, was was that you highlight in the movie or in the documentary, sorry, that, of course, his temporary home in London for a few months last year when he was in prison uh, ended up being, I think, three miles down the road from Centre Court. Yeah, that's right. He was in Wandsworth Prison, in Wandsworth prison and it was not fun for him at all. Um, but you're also right, you know, I think London was very definitely his home. And I do think he was much loved by pretty much everyone here. I, you know, I think he he was he was we'd we'd adopted him as a as a as a fellow as an Englishman up to a point. Um yeah, the whole prison experience was incredibly, incredibly poignant and difficult and hard for him. And 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 you know, he said he watched Wimbledon from inside prison in tears. He watched Novak win, and you know, you can imagine how difficult that must have been. At the same time, you know, Boris took his punishment. He he acknowledged that he had no one else but himself to blame and that he had to serve the time he had to serve. Um and I, I know it's I know it's upsetting for him that he's not able to come back to England, although he will be able to and in and not too far away, but it's definitely yeah. it's definitely really painful for him to not be able to come back here. Yeah, that was kind of the second sort of poignant element about his love affair with the UK is that it's it's had to be severed for a, a couple of years at least because he's not able to return given the conditions of his release. Mm. Um, what about Boris now? Um, do you think that there's a chance, and maybe I'm just hoping this for, for him and, and, and someone who has followed his career as well, um, do you think there's a chance that maybe, given the the roller coaster he was on from 17 all the way to the to the moment he went behind bars, that maybe now he's at at his most peace, perhaps? I think there is a chance. Actually, I think I think you know his perspective on life has shifted quite significantly, as 10 months in prison will do for anyone, I suspect. Um, I think he. You know, I think he the whole process of the 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 process that led to him going to prison, as well as the four years he spent working with us to make this film, and then the process of him watching the film as it took its shape in front of him, has has hum, has had a profound effect on him. You know, and I think I think you know he feels he's still a young man with a lot ahead of him. So in some respects, I think he feels incredibly lucky that he's still got all of that. You know, he's still got all of that ahead. So. So I do think that he's, a, you know, he's in a, as far as I'm aware, a very, very happy relationship with an extremely, very smart, very bright, very charming, another very charming woman, um, who who definitely has his best interests at heart. So I think, yeah, I think he's in a really good place. Yeah, and um, I, I hope he doesn't get led down any uh, financial alleyways and. And as you say, he, he, he's working on Eurosport largely. Uh, I like actually, although I mentioned how in, in Germany, at least amongst the public, there was has been some skepticism. You also highlighted how the tabloid media was. However, the German tennis community, the, the tight tennis community, if you like, and the federation and also television has welcomed him back with open arms. Uh, he's on Eurosport for three of the Grand Slams of the year, I think, only because they don't have Wimbledon, I believe. Um, 
and and there is a sort of a, a nice career for him to have and an, a nice life without too many financial pressures that that many of us have especially if you go through bankruptcy so mm. i i hope that that um that he have you have you spoken to him at all in the last say four or five months since i mean because yeah. you had the the the, the, the berlin ali thing and uh, and stuff in february march so i saw him in berlin we exchange voice notes every now and then i you know i, I i'm conscious of one of the things boris said which was and this is a familiar refrain isn't it that a lot of people who he thought his friends turned out to not be his friends because they all headed for the hills as soon as the shit mm -hmm. hit the fan and mm -hmm. although i wouldn't say he and i are good are close friends i've known him for five or six years i'm really fond of him and i want him to know that i now that the film's made i don't just drop off the planet i care for him and i like to know that he's uh, he and lillian are doing well so we send each other messages from every now and then um you know i think i think i think yeah i think i think he's got a good support system now and i i i, I think you know, as you say, the tennis community never stopped loving him. You know, in, in the film, Johnny Mac says, you know, Boris, we miss you and we love you. They ever, you know, once the careers are over, all these people have tremendous amount of respect for each other. Mats Verlander equally, you know, the only other tennis, the only other player to win a Grand Slam age 17, another hero of mine. Um, you know, he's, he, he feels, you know, he feels very fondly about Boris as, and they all do. They all, they all have a huge amount of respect for him because as we know, in, in that world, you've won six majors and three of them were Wimbledon yeah any you know you are you're up there and you'll always be up there in the eyes of all the others mm. Does, is Boris happy with it the the overall product yes he is you know as we always knew as I always said to him there'll always be things about it that niggle him because when you tell someone's life story it's never going to be everything they they imagined it was going to be or everything they wanted it to be you know at one point we had a list of a zillion famous people that Boris would have liked to have had in the film. You can't get all those people in a film. Um, and I've had that experience with many people because I've been lucky enough to work with some amazing famous people from the sporting world and other worlds. But but fundamentally, he loves the film because I think you would you would say yourself, it's a great tribute to the man and his career and it, it acknowledges his flaws and his mistakes. But one of the good things about Boris is that he acknowledges his flaws. He doesn't pretend they didn't happen. He knows they did happen. He doesn't pretend any other way. So he knew by working with me and Alex, it's not like we were going to bypass that. It was always going to be part of it, but it's always going to be hard for him to watch. Uh, it's certainly a stellar lineup, and we've pretty much touched on many of the main protagonists as well. Was there one or two people that you tried to get and didn't get or could have got and wanted to get? I think we would have loved to have got Andre and we didn't really get anywhere near getting Andre. We would have liked to get Ivan Landel and we got we got directly to him, but he basically didn't want to do it. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I had a feeling Andre might be one and I think it's just that he tends to stay away from the sport as, as a that's whole. Right. But he's not, I don't think Andre, again, that's a film I'd love to make, but I don't think Andre, you know, you don't see Andre popping up in many documentaries of any sort, let alone something like this. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, it, maybe it'll happen one day. I mean, he's got a book out there, of course, probably one of the most well-known tennis books here, exactly book. open. But uh, anyway, listen, John, big thanks for your time today and uh, good luck on, on your journey. But even uh, this documentary, of course, which will be around for a long time to come and is available, I think, on Apple TV uh, to, to watch. So thanks very much, John. Pleasure. Thanks, John. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.